I hear the Bible writer saying, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. It is good to see young people doing things for God. Amen. I have about 10 minutes, and in about 10 minutes, I'm going to do a real quick run through from African American history. We're going to start all the way back in 1525 when those first slave ships started coming. And they came from about 1525 to the early part of the 17th century. And some would, would say, well, it wasn't a big deal to bring blacks to America because in Africa there were slaves. And that's true, there were slaves in Africa, but here's the difference. In Africa, if you were a slave, you could work your way out of slavery. You could work yourself into your freedom. And many people thought that the slaves that were coming to America, when they got to America, they would start off as slaves. But just as they could work their way to freedom in Africa, they were able to work their way to freedom in America, but it was not so. But that wasn't the worst part of the deal. There was a four to six weeks journey from Africa on to the northern hemisphere, or the western hemisphere. You had North America and South America where slaves go away. And depending on where you went, that trip took about four to six weeks. But that trip was absolutely horrible because they put people in little areas just like sardines. They were putting men and men back to back and women and women back to back. They were packed so tight they couldn't even move. And if you got sick, the person in front of you and behind you got sick because you were just that close. The conditions were so bad that some people would actually go to the side of the boat and jump overboard to get out of the misery. And if one person got sick and started making other people sick, they were all held in shackles. They would just put the whole line of shackles and just throw them overboard so all of them would die to preserve the rest of them. It's estimated that of the 12 million slaves that left Africa, 2.5 million died in the ocean before they even got here. Horrible conditions get here. And so now they get here to the Americas, North and South America. They forbid them to speak their language. They separated men from women. And to make that worse, they treat them like barbarians. Here's what I mean. They find a big, strong man, and they put him on a platform like this, and they poke and they claw him to show him how big and strong he was. All he had on was something to cover his midsection. That's all he had on. And they paraded him around to show people how big and strong he was. And somebody will say, I'll buy that big, strong black man over there. And they do the women the same way. And somebody will say, I'll buy that big, strong woman over there. And they make the man and woman procreate, not because they love each other, but because they were a big, strong slave. Yeah. And they tell the man and woman, we don't want you to take care of the baby, just make the baby. Isn't it funny we still have men and women that won't take care of babies, but they will make babies? And I want to suggest it goes back to when we first got here. So now they, they see the famine and they destroy the famine. They won't let slaves read and they won't let slaves write. All you can do is go to the fields and pick the cottons. This keep going on, and about the, the end of the 17th century, the beginning of the 18th century, an interesting thing happens. The cotton gin is discovered. Some people will say Eli Whitney discovered the cotton gin. I have a real problem with that. And here's what I have the problem with. Eli Whitney is from the New England area, which is the northeastern part of the United States. How did a man from the northeastern part of the United States, where cotton does not grow, discover the cotton gin? Can I give you my take on it? He was visiting a friend of his who had a plantation down in the, in the Carolinas, and he saw slaves using what later became the cotton gin, but because slaves couldn't own anything, so they owned it. He went to another place and said, look what I invented, and now in history, we give him credit for something for slave. I can top that with Louis Latimer. Thomas Edison is given credit for discovering the light bulb. Louis Latimer had just as much to do with what am I saying? I'm saying that all these inventors, and look, I'm not against white folk, I'm just saying we need to get our just to. And there are a lot of intelligent, articulate black men and women that did just as much as the white men and women. On the 1865, we give tremendous credit to Abraham Lincoln for the Emancipation Proclamation. We say, man, Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. He's our friend. Let me tell you what was going on. Tell us, tell us. Well, with the discovery of the cotton gin, we didn't need all these slaves to pick cotton because it was so much easier. So we had, we had actually maximized on it. We, we streamlined the process. We don't need a lot of slaves. So now what are we going to do? Oh, Abraham Lincoln has a way out here. Now blacks are free. Yay, no blacks are free. Because you don't free me just because you say I'm no longer a slave. Young people, the only way to be free is to be free spiritually, socially, yeah. economically. All right. And we weren't free any of those ways. So even though blacks were free, they were right back to the same plantation that they were on. Because they still had to eat. Oh, and now we don't call 
it slavery, we call it indentured servitude. In other words, you will work for me and all I will give you is enough to feed yourself. Well, about this time you have, we're in the 18th century now. We have men like Frederick Douglass, and women like Sojourner Truth saying, wait a minute, this just isn't right. The treatments of African Americans and American right, we are smart, we are intellectual. We do have gifts, we do have talents, we do have abilities. We can do more than just make babies and work on farms. We are smart people. And so they went around and they get up and they start speaking. And he said, let me show you how wrong this is. And he showed his back that he'd been beat to the white meat. And they said, I don't care who you are. It's inhumane to treat anybody like this. And people started listening. And eventually we came up from Jim Crow. We had great people like Robert F. Kennedy. Yes, a white man. There were a lot of white people who fought with blacks for equality. Robert F. Kennedy, and of course, uh, Martin Luther King is the face of it. But before those two came around, let me tell you about two men who were very instrumental. There were uh, Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. Yes. These were two of the sharpest brothers you would ever see. But they had two different, two different takes on it. Booker T. Washington, he thought like this. Listen, if you want to treat us like second-class citizens, I'm okay with that. But at least teach us how to farm our own land. Let us get a little bit of an education so we can take care of ourselves. And you know what? Black people appreciated that. They said, yeah, just, just give us a little bit and we'll take it. W.E.B. Du Bois said, no, no, we just as smart as y'all. We want everything that you have. Give us equal rights. So in the late 1800s, we had a Booker T. Washington camp who just, and matter of fact, Booker T. Washington, he founded Tuskegee University for the purpose of teaching African Americans about agriculture, how to take care of your own land, how to grow something other than cotton, how to, how to take care of you and your family in the fields. And then we had W.E.B. Du Bois said, you know what, there are some of us who do want to pick cotton, who do want to be farmers, but there are others who want to be intellectuals, doctors, and lawyers, and we should have that opportunity. Yes, yes. And many believe that. And so now blacks have the right to vote, but wait a minute, to vote you have to be able to read. Nobody ever taught us how to read. And as a matter of fact, if you got caught teaching a black man how to read, there were punishments for you. If a black person got caught trying to read, he would be beaten for trying to read. And God forbid we got black kids skipping class when folk died for you to learn how to read. Now. Have you lost your mind? Now. All Why right. in the world would you not take advantage of your All education right opportunity now. when yes. people died for you to have yes. it? Yes. People realize that without education, you have no hope in this world. And then we got black kids getting mad because mama say, go to school. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Again, Martin Luther King, they fight for civil rights. And you know what? And look, I'm not against it, but, but it makes me wonder, why are we still saying we want civil rights? Can I tell you something? We have civil rights. If you're in Temple Belton, you have a you have great opportunities for school. Let me tell you what we need now. We don't need civil rights. We need or civil freedoms. We have those. We need economic freedoms. Yeah, See, yeah. any black person can go into a high school and take any class you want to take. Yeah. So it's time for black to take advantage of that. Yeah. Why? Yeah. All right. I'm saying it is time right. for African Americans, yeah. specifically like you, to realize yeah. what yeah. people went through yeah. to get us where yeah. we are yeah. today. Opportunity. The problem is we're not all taking advantage of the opportunities presented. Now I will Man. say we are a little behind, and here's why. You know they they they, they set us free, and they said, "Well, now black, you know, because they, they they come against affirmative action really hard." Let me tell you why I'm with, I'm with affirmative action. We are we we everybody here is play monopoly, right? Play monopoly. Okay. What if you let me go around the board twenty times? Buy all the property, and then I said, you can play the game. That's what happened with black America. Yeah, from 1776, well, let's go back from the founding of this nation until 1865, we couldn't play. And in 1865, they said, now you can play. All the property's been bought up. All we trying to do is skip, get out of jail free, and get the income tax time. that are presented to me. I'm not looking for civil rights, I'm looking for economic rights. Amen. Uh, I, you know what we need? Yes. We need to see blacks in City Hall. That's what we need yes. to see. Yes. You know what we need to see? We need to see blacks owning more businesses.
Jesus. That's yes. what we need to say. And that's why programs like this are important to let our African American youth know you can be great. There are great opportunities out there, so take advantage of them. It is okay to take a tough class. It's okay to take a hard class. Because you know, the kids that are taking a hard class is now, you know what you'll call them in 10 years? You'll call them the boss, the CEO, the president. That you'll call them that guy with that big old house and that woman with that bad car. That's what you call them. I want to challenge our African American youth to realize that I'm about to close them. There are three enemies to your empowerment. There are three. The first one is ignorance. Ignorance. You don't realize what it took to get you where you are. Had you been born, listen, this is 2017. Had you been born 50 years ago, which is, some, there are people here older than 50. You wouldn't have the opportunities you have. There was a time when you couldn't drink from that water fountain. There was a time you couldn't eat in that restaurant. Mm -hmm. And because I don't realize the struggle that my ancestors pushed through to get me where I am now, I don't appreciate it. Ignorance is an enemy to your power. The next one is apathy. Apathy is I just don't care. I, I, I just don't care. I don't care. I just, I just, I just, I don't care enough to pay attention in school. I know everybody else is acting a fool, but you don't have to act a fool. At some point, you've got to say, I'm better than that. Yes, Lord. Just because you want to throw away your opportunity, does not mean I'm going to throw away my opportunity. Amen. I refuse to act like everybody else, Amen. and everybody else is acting ignorant. Amen. I refuse to. Yes. See, yes. it's not that we can't be better. But to be better, you gotta do better. Right. It's not that we can't have more, but to have more, you got to do more. Ignorance is the enemy of your empowerment. Apathy is the enemy of your empowerment. And the next one is entertainment. Entertainment. I'd rather sit up all night shaking Facebook status and see who the last person on Twitter and who Snapchatted me than pay attention to school. We, we in class, ha, listen to me, how silly is this? The teacher is giving a review of a test that's going to be given tomorrow and I'm on Twitter. I mean, let's just think about that. How dumb are you? And I'm just calling it like it is. That is so dumb. That you got to be smarter than that. Don't let entertainment rob you of your greatness. Amen. At some point, you got to let the main thing be the main thing. And the main thing is not what somebody eat for lunch. The main thing is what can I do to put me in a position to be great? Amen. That's the main oh. thing. That's the main thing. Yeah. I know, I know some, somebody did something funny. You know what? I can look at the funny stuff later. There is a time for that. But when they review it for a test, that's just not the time. I want to challenge you to step up. Step up. Don't let ignorance rob you of your greatness. That's right. Amen. Don't let apathy rob you of your greatness. Yes, yes. And don't let entertainment rob you of your greatness. Amen. Amen.